With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked, temperature set, lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details. You've discovered your link to GoPowerCat.com's PowerCat podcast. Now, here's your host, GoPowerCat.com publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. So much went right for Kansas State last week at Baylor. The Wildcats ran the ball, the best that they have all season. The defense absolutely stifled the Baylor offense in the first half, sacking the quarterback six times. By all rights, it should have been a Kansas State victory. The Wildcats owned both sides of the line of scrimmage for a majority of the game. But Baylor figured out how to do enough, just enough, to have the ball as time expired and kick a field goal during a 32-31 victory. It was Kansas State's fourth straight loss on the season as the Cats dropped to 4-4 four four in Big 12 play, 4-5 and five overall. Well, Kansas State will look to right the ship as it returns home for the regular season finale against Texas on Saturday. The game kicks off at 11 a.m. from Bill Snyder Family Stadium and will be shown on Fox. Four straight losses. That's what K-State carries into this game. On the other sideline is Texas at 5-3. and three. Still one more game scheduled to play next week against Kansas, but Texas has been eliminated from the Big 12 championship. The Longhorns cannot play for a Big 12 title, and thus two star players have declared their season over as they prepare for the NFL draft. Texas and Kansas State. Welcome to the Fitz and Keats Powercat pregame show brought to you by Robbins Motor Company. I'm Go Powercat publisher Tim Fitzgerald, and I'll be joined by Kevin Keatsman of Kevin Keatsman Has Issues, a new podcast out of Kansas City. Make sure you're downloading it if you like Kansas City sports and news. Make sure you're listening to Keats, a Kansas City radio legend. But this is the Kansas State versus Texas football preview. In the second half, I'll be joined by the Roundtable crew. That is Ryan Wallace of the Go Powercat staff, Brian Hanley, our Go Powercat football analyst and former Kansas State football player, and our gambling expert, Kelly Stewart. Kelly in Vegas on social media and also a K-State alumnus. And we'll have it all lined up with that roundtable to talk about this game and everything that's going to go into it as we proceed through this preview. We are sponsored by Robbins Motor Company. At Robbins Motor Company, they strive to earn lifetime business and build relationships selling quality cars, trucks, vans, SUVs, and offering top-notch parts and service. Robbins Motor Company, title sponsor of the Powercat pregame show. As I mentioned, Texas enters this game with a 5-3 and three overall record. The Longhorns are 4-3 and three in Big 12 play. They're coming off three straight one-possession outcomes, beginning with a 41-34 victory at Oklahoma State and continuing with a 17-13 home win over West Virginia. But last week, Texas suffered a 23-20 home setback to Iowa State on the day after Thanksgiving ending their regular season home schedule with a loss. And, of course, the Longhorns are led by senior quarterback Sam Ellinger, who heads into the game as the team's leading passer and leading rusher. Running back B. John Robinson has come on as of late for the Longhorns, while Brennan Eagles and Joshua Moore lead the team in receptions. On defense, Juwan Mitchell is the team's leading tackler with 56 stops. And Joseph Asai, a great linebacker, has a Big 12 best, 14 tackles for loss and four sacks on the season. The all-time series between the Cats and Horns is tied at 10-10, but the Wildcats hold a 9-7 margin since the two became members of the Big 12 together. But Texas has won each of the last three games, its longest streak in the series and each of the last three contests were decided by six points or less. This is expected to be another close game. The spread on the game is Texas by seven on the Cats' home field, and we'll see if it plays out in the Longhorns' favor or if the Cats can finish the season by ending a losing streak and finishing at five and four in the Big 12. Well, let's get started with this edition of the Powercat pregame show. 
And now we bring in my sidekick, Kevin Keatsman. Keats, uh, the month of November is over, thankfully, for Kansas State football. That turned out to be a unproductive stretch of games. Yeah. Four losses in five weeks. It, You know, and if you back up and look at the course of the season, you're still four and four in the conference. But, boy, when the, when they all happen in a row, it gives a different context to the, the actual meaning of 4-4 four and four because, boy, at 4-0, and oh, you're ready for, to play in the Super Bowl. I mean, you're, you're talking Big 12 championship, all that stuff, and then it starts to slide away, and here we are, 4-4, four and four, as Texas comes to town on Saturday, and it's also a wounded Texas team that may not have much to play for. What are your overall impressions of this game as we prepare for the Cats and Horns? Well, first, it's great to be the sidekick because there's so little pressure. So I love being on here doing this with you. It's fantastic to not have any of the pressure. That's great. It would be great if Chris Kleiman and the Wildcats could find a way to not have pressure on them. But I feel like they're going to probably feel some pressure this week. I think the biggest problem they have going into this game is the last couple games that they've played well, they should have won the games. They had them won, and they blew it. And there's various reasons. One was the fumble against Oklahoma State. Turnover cost him big time there. I thought Chris Kleiman had his worst four minutes at Kansas State last week, the last four minutes of the game. They did not give themselves a chance to get a first down and chew any clock up. I mean, they just didn't. It was so uncreative, so 1970s. I can't even believe it. Then defensively, I would have used – I'm starting to see a lot of coaches do this, Fitz. They're using their timeouts earlier to try to slow the momentum of the last drive of the other team. In other words, there's three minutes and 40 seconds left. If the first play of that drive on first down, somebody gets three yards or they throw, if they throw incomplete, obviously the clock stops. But if you get into a situation, you can use your timeout there instead of waiting till the very end. Timeouts did K-State no good in that game. I mean, he just didn't use them effectively at all. It's a hard thing to criticize because nobody's really done it that way before. I'm starting to see it a little bit in the NFL. But what's the difference? If, you, if you're trying to stop a drive, okay, what's the difference whether you stop it at three minutes, two minutes, or under one minute? Use your timeouts. You might break their momentum. And I think what we saw Baylor do was get momentum on that drive and really get into a rhythm because the clock was rolling and they were in their hurry up and doing their thing. Sometimes you can use your timeouts to effectively break the other team. That's a strong criticism, I know. But if K-State's going to play a bunch of close games, I've said this before about Chris Kleiman, he didn't have a lot of close games at North Coast State. So he needs to spend a little time in the offseason looking at charts, understanding numbers, maybe look at what the Chiefs do because Andy Reid's become maybe the best in the business at this. I mean, that was used to really be a knock on Andy Reid. But, again, he's great with it. It's easy to be great when Patrick Mahomes is your quarterback, but he's great at it. There's a lot of information and data out there. He might need a guy to help him with some of this stuff. They could have won that game, I think, with just a little bit better play calling and management again because Baylor isn't very good. And Kansas State was the better team most of the day, and they should have won. So going into the Texas game, which was your question, I know I'm rambling on and on and on. I, you know, I don't know that sometimes they show up and they're just terrible, K-State. And then the games where they play well, I don't know how they could possibly have any confidence to win a game right now. So, I mean, I don't see K-State winning by 20. So if it's a close game and, you know, there's eight minutes left in the game and it's a three-point game one way or another, I just don't have much confidence that K-State's going to pull that game out. So... I think it's going to be really hard for them to get to five and four. The psychological impact of this game, you just mentioned how uh, K-State's got to be down. But if you're Texas, you're coming to Manhattan, Kansas, to play a a game in what you consider freezing cold weather, it'll be 50. Um, You know, your coach is kind of dead in the water. There's a lot of talk in Austin about Urban Meyer or the next guy that Tom Herman's dead. He's gone. This is it for him. I, you know, you, you approach it from that standpoint, and I'm like, outside of Sam Ellinger, I don't know who's going to be real fired up for the Longhorns to play in Manhattan, Kansas on Saturday. I I just don't know. I wouldn't touch this game if I was a gambler because uh, I can figure out advantages, X's and O's, but that mental part of the game, if you're Texas, I don't know what the Longhorns are going to present for the Wildcats. If they'll be even one bit interested in this game, we will find out. Well, I don't think they'll play an inspired game. I don't think they're bringing their best. I agree with you there. So, you know, Kleiner and the staff may know by Friday if if it's a good week of practice and the guys are motivated and and a winning record means something to them, they may see it in their eyes that K-State's going to come out all fiery and play hard. If they do, 
I think they've got every chance in, in the world to win this game. You know, I don't really worry about Ellinger beating me through the air. I do worry about him scrambling, especially on passing plays. I know he's a very good running quarterback as well, but he, you know, a lot of times it's the breakdown of the passing plays that really is Ellinger's A game, and that's where he's beaten the Cats before. They haven't had a lot of luck against this team, but the years that Kansas State has beaten Texas, I think we'd agree, Fitz, most of the years, all through the years, most of the time we watch Texas, we're like, okay, well, they just don't bring it against K-State like they try to bring it against Oklahoma or if they're playing USC in the non-con or whatever. K-State's kind of had that advantage. I don't know that there's any of that in this game at all, and, and I don't know what K-State has left in the tank. They, they've had more players cycle in and out than anybody in the conference. It's just a really tough situation. If you can rally the guys, motivate them, tell them, look, play one more good game, we're going to win this one in the end, and have a winning record and you can hang your heads high, I think that's a pretty good way to try to motivate if you're Chris Kleiman. The question is, does it work? I agree. It's going to be very interesting. Sam Ellinger, though, is a fascinating case study. This guy plays his butt off. He's passed for more than 2,000 yards a season. He somehow leads Texas in rushing at 388 yards a season. They've kind of got a three-headed monster in the backfield. They, those three guys are nearing 1,000 yards as a trio, but... Uh, this team offensively follows Sam Ellinger. I think he's a little overvalued as a quarterback. If he was not at Texas but was at uh, Texas Tech, or that's a bad – you won't have a running quarterback like that. Uh, Baylor. If he was at Baylor with these same numbers, I don't think people would be nearly impressed as they are with him. Uh, you know, they would say nice things about him like they do Charlie Brewer, but you wouldn't be talking about he's the best quarterback in the Big 12. But he's at Texas, so he gets that love. What I like about him is he's a bulldog, um, and he's the type of kid you would want at quarterback just because he'll he'll fight to the very end and he'll lead your team, but they just don't have much to work with. I like Brennan Eagles, a receiver. He's a big guy, could give K-State a lot of problems, but it doesn't scare the daylights out of me. I just don't understand how Texas doesn't have more weapons and is not more scary offensively than what this Texas team actually is. Well, you know, when I look at him, Fitz, I, you can see the talent. You can see the size of the players. They're going to have they're going to have a size and athleticism advantage. He recruits at a very high level. There's guys going to get drafted. They're headed to the NFL. He doesn't have a shortage of good players. I think with Tom Herman, the, the shocking thing with me is just how poorly, well, I won't say poorly coached, how inconsistently coached they are because they've had some really good games where you look at Texas and you go, man, look at those parts. They've always got tall receivers. They've always got linebackers that can fly around the field. You know, they've got athletes all over the field. I thought this guy could coach. I thought that was the, the, the rap sheet on him when they hired him was, look what he did at Houston. Look at the X's and O's on this guy. He's going to set the world on fire. I don't know what happens with Texas coaches when they get to Texas, but they're never as good as where they were. <laughs> they have all these great players, and they couldn't beat the teams they came from. So all I can figure is if you just follow the recruiting board and go get the best players, you're missing intangibles on a lot of players. You're missing the heart. You're missing the want-to. There maybe are some guys on this team, you know, I hate to even put it in these terms, he may have some really stupid players that are just five stars and you go gobble them up because they're from Texas and you know they're the fastest guy. That doesn't always win in college football. Yeah. It doesn't. And I'm afraid Tom Herman fell into the same trap. They need a coach that maybe understands the balance of, yes, we need to go out and get it. If we're recruiting 24 players this year, we need to go get 12 of the best athletes and 12 of the smartest, toughest, grittiest team guys you've ever seen and piece them together and let that class come together. And they can teach things about each other. I, I just think they, they get it wrong a lot of times in Texas. It's just too much all about the talent and not enough about the heart and how do you play this game. I agree with you. I think they end up with too many guys that have been the star player their entire lives, have been physically superior to the opposition their entire lives. And they get to Texas or, you know, whatever school it is as a five-star, and they realize, hey, I'm, I'm not the star anymore. I don't know how to handle this. Uh, and uh, also, I just can't run over everyone on the other side of the ball. I mean, they're, I'm still bigger and faster, but they're pretty darn good themselves. Um, although Texas defensively has some linebackers that can run over people, uh, again, it gets to – want to and are they going to really get after it and play some quality football on Saturday uh, you know as I look around the Big 12 I don't think the conference is very good this season Keats um, but Texas has been in these games they played everyone close they played certainly look at Iowa State they were with the Cyclones the whole day and K-State certainly can't say that um, I, I don't know what Will Howard's going to see from this Texas defense 
uh, schematically, but I know this, when he lines up, he's going to see some big dudes on the other side of the ball that can really run, and I worry about how Will Howard and Deuce Vaughn handle that. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it's one thing to, to get a linebacker or a safety from Baylor on his heels and get around him. Man, these Texas guys are a whole different breed of athlete. Uh, but Will Howard has to play better. He just has to play better than he did uh, in so many games, and he kind of came to life against Baylor, which I thought was a good sign. He did. He's still physically, and I mean physically more than anything. You know, it looks like a freshman to me. He just, I'm, I, I'm, I give the kid credit. He's been pretty durable in as much as he's played. I think he looks a little skinny and fragile myself. No, you know, needs to bulk up a little bit. That's typical of any first year player in a Power Five program. You got some work to do. I mean, Deuce Vaughn obviously is very small. That's where it comes in when you're just looking across at people going, "Holy crap, that guy's way bigger than me." You know, there's a mental factor to these games that we can't really see when we watch them, but those players sense and feel that but again just because there may be some nfl linebackers on the other side if they're not breathing fire over there if they don't see snot coming out their nose you know coming after them it's not that daunting you know you can you can beat guys that you know aren't playing their hardest and it doesn't take very long to figure things like that out if, you know in football or basketball you look across the line you're like okay these guys aren't interested that's why you see so many games where there's you know 21 to nothing starts or something like that then all of a sudden in the second half the team behind starts playing harder and you're like, oh, wow, you know, what a wake-up call. I don't know why that happens in sports, especially in football. Fits. They're going to play 10 games this year, right? I mean, you're, you're out there playing 10 games. How hard is it to want to eat broken glass 10 days a year? That's really all you're asking. Is, so here, here it is today, boys. Here's one of 10 chances. Go breathe fire for me. But, man, sports are funny. And a lot of times they just don't. And we'll see. I think Will Howard, Deuce Vaughn, and those guys will know right away what that Texas defense is up to when this thing gets started. Good point. Very good point. Um, K-State fans are a lot of discontent fans right now. Or maybe it's just you hear from the minority that's discontent. Um, with Chris Kleiman, certainly with Courtney Messingham, the offensive coordinator, uh, is any of that justified? I mean, some people are declaring this program is falling apart with all the transfers. Do, do you f- have any of those feelings right now about K-State football? Zero. Yeah. Zero. I, I, this is too weird of a year. It's too weird of a year, and I think we know too much. And, and you know, the most telling thing Kleiman said all year was last week when he said, we got to work on this team off the field. All right? He didn't go into detail. When you hear a coach say that, he's got personality problems on his team. He's got some people that are not, you know, doing what the coaches want and things like that. I don't have any time. Look, these guys that transferred out were not going to do it the Chris Kleiman way. Get them out of there. The coach has to have full authority and, and power. I don't know how many of them he recruited versus Bill Snyder. That's still in play a little bit here. That's very natural in any program. It is quite obvious Chris Kleiman knows how to coach. Um, it is quite obvious that the players that like him love him. All right? So what he needs is 100 kids that buy in completely to what they're doing, and he probably needs 30 really good football players out of that 100. And if you can find 30 really good football players out of 100 and everybody's bought in, K-State's going to be really good. I can't go there this year. I mean, you lost your starting quarterback with everything that's happened, even if they had personality problems, even if there were guys leaving the programs. If Skylar Thompson plays every game, they win the Oklahoma State and the Baylor game for sure. Okay? Yeah. So they're 6-2 and two right now in the Big 12 and alive for the title game with, with a game to go. I mean, it's just sitting there for them. So, no, absolutely not. It's, you know, would you love to have three quarterbacks in your program? Yes. Most schools don't have one. K-State had one. They were off to a flying start with that kid, and he wasn't going to win the Heisman or anything. But, my God, Skyler Thompson knows how to win football games. And when they lost him, it changed everything. It just did. I, it, it just does. So, no. Chris Kleiman, for me, for my money, complete free pass this year. I thought it was interesting in the post-game press conference after Baylor – uh, Kleiman just flat out said you'll has, have to ask Mess about that, in referencing Courtney Messingham as offensive coordinator, um, because he seems uh, totally disconnected from what the offense is scheming and planning to do. You know, I, I'm not used to that because Bill Snyder was an offensive guy. Chris Kleiman's a defensive guy. Um, I think he's put too much, given his offensive coordinator, too much – leash and I think he's trying to pull that back in a little bit and try to get more involved in the schematics of what they're doing offensively because you mentioned that that last possession and and they 
they point out that that one of them was a read, and and Will Howard just read the wrong thing. He should have kept the ball and he handed it off, and it ended up getting stopped and stoned. And the and his read was wide open as it was on the touchdown he had a little bit earlier in the game. Uh, I'm wondering if they're not going to really evaluate what they're doing on offense and, and look at it, not changing the schemes, but how they use the schemes. Because, uh, again, we, we're running into this, and we saw it with Snyder. You, you see the same plays over and over when you know there's other things in that playbook. Uh, and, you know, it's just baffling sometimes on offense. They'll have something that works really well, and then they don't go back to it at all. They act like it never happened. Uh, so I just think – I think the offense is just out of sync. They don't know what to lean on. They don't have enough tools. And I think Courtney Messingham's in his own head, so to speak, and trying to figure out what to do. Uh, your thoughts on how K-State is moving the ball, and uh, is it talent or coordinator? I think their strategy, from what I can tell, because I've told you a bunch this year, that you know they, they make so many big plays on offense. It's totally – contradictory to what they are you know their skill level yeah. i think their strategy is we're going to bore you to death <laughs> until you fall asleep and we're going to hit you yeah. and that's kind of what they do and i don't think you can win the big 12 that way i think you're going to need a little bit more than that i love the way you defend i love the way their defensive scheme i love a lot of things that they do they're going to need more offensively but they need more good players to do that and more experience certainly so that's part of it what i didn't like at the end of that game was it's fine if courtney messingham's calling the plays a lot of coaches want their offensive coordinator to call the plays, but you're the head coach, and the directive that should have been given right there was, Courtney, get me to midfield. Get me 30 yards, all right? Get, forget the clock. I don't care about it. Go get me two or three first downs. Let's move the ball. Let's run our offense. Use the plays, and if we turn it over, we turn it over. We're not the kind of team that is just going to line up and run between the tackles here in the Big 12 and run out the clock. K-State is not going to do that. Run the offense. Let's get me 30 yards, Courtney. We're, we're playing to win the game with our offense right here. And they never did that. They played it like you would in the 1970s. Run, run, incomplete, punt. And you're just like, wow, that's just not good enough. So the head coach can give a directive to the offensive coordinator. If you don't, the offensive coordinator is going to play it safe because they don't want to be blamed for throwing an interception or turning the ball over on an end around or a reverse or you know, some sort of a shovel pass or a screen pass or something that is a little bit complicated or tricky. He doesn't want to wear that. He doesn't want to be responsible for losing the game. The coach has to tell him, take some chances here, go win the game. We don't want to go back on the field and play defense. Yeah, you're exactly right. And that's what Courtney Messingham did. He was so conservative and didn't want to do anything wrong. I think his focus was on keeping the clock running instead of picking up first downs. Right. Uh, well, I know, I know I'd have done the same thing as the offensive coordinator – you, you know, you're going to get blamed if there's a turnover or a couple of incompletions. They're going to say, what the hell was Zach Trevenham doing? Well, he did what every offensive coordinator is supposed to do. He played it close to the vest. What I'm saying is, Kleiman needed to tell him, I'll take the heat for whatever happens. Go get me 30 or 40 yards. Okay, right here. We don't need to score. Get me 30 or 40 yards and this game is over. Okay. And I don't think Chris Kleiman said that to him at all. No, that's, that gets back to it. I think he's a little bit too hands off of that offense right now. And, and uh, um, maybe he needs to get more involved. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Keats, I think you've nailed it, though. Uh, Courtney Messingham's tendency as an offense coordinator was to be painfully conservative right there because that's how you played football back in the day. Now things have changed. But the even within the context of the season, things have changed because they don't have the depth right now on defense to be as fresh as they were against Oklahoma or some of those other right. games when they played really well. That defense had been stressed by Charlie Brewer. They had done a good job. They'd played their butts off in the first half, and they were a shell of themselves by the fourth quarter because they were out of linebackers. The two guys they had out there, bless their hearts, had been running around all day and were shot, were absolutely done by the time Baylor got that ball. Uh, and I think some of the mathematics of the equation in Chris Kleiman's brain shifted on him. Uh, and we're kind of seeing that a little bit this year. Maybe struggling with time management, maybe struggling with uh, you know kind of the flow of the game, and and those type of things. Some of those in-game decisions that honestly, Keith, he hasn't had to make 
when you're up by four touchdowns in every game at North Dakota State, you don't have a lot of these stress situations at the end where you kind of figure out what you do as a coach. He's going through that painfully for K-State fans to see as he learns to coach in late-game situations, which he hasn't had to do. Man, I'm telling you, in the offseason, they got a lot of spare time. Yeah. I would spend a, a huge portion of my time with my staff on, man, how are we going to become the best late-game team in the Big 12? I want to know everything about what we can do. I'm getting on a plane. I'm going to Seattle. I'm going to talk to Pete Carroll in the offseason. That outfit wins more close games than anything I've ever seen in my life. And I know he's got Russell Wilson. But, you know, Russell Wilson's great. They should be winning by 20 more often in Seattle, and they don't. <laughs> but their games always come down to the wire, and every time you see Pete Carroll over there celebrating, oh, all right, you know, Pete, what is it? What do you got? What's, what's the magic potion here? You know, go talk to some of these coaches that are really good at winning games late and, and find out what it is. And is it motivation? Is it situations? Do you practice it more than other teams? Do you have a, an analytics guy that has a chart that's telling you everything in your head, exactly what you're doing here? I don't know what the best of them do, but I can sit here and name four or five coaches that are really good at winning close games. And if Chris Kleiman becomes that, he can very quickly become the third best program in this league. I mean, that, that's not hard. If you become the team that wins all your close games, you can become number three real fast. But right now, he's not that. I would agree. I have no problem with the K-State offense structurally. In fact, I like it. I think it can work in this conference. I think it can be effective in this conference. But one of the things it has to be better at is being unpredictable. And Honestly, they've gotten a little bit predictable. Maybe that's because of the lack of weapons. But uh, that has been an emphasis for me. The biggest thing for this program, uh, Chris Kleiman thinks it's his locker room. I respect that. He does have issues. He does have a divide. We're all beginning to see it and feel it, even though the wind's covered it up for a while. They've been divided a little bit this season. Um, but I think the biggest thing he has to do is self-scout. And he, he mentioned it on Monday's Big 12 Teleconference. We do that. But doing exactly what you just said, really put everything on the table, including your pride, and say, what can we do differently to make this better? I look at Illinois basketball. Brad Underwood put his pride aside and had a recent college graduate run numbers for him, analytics, and tell him, well, you're, you're playing too aggressively on defense. You're trying so hard to get turnovers. You're letting the other team shoot free throws. Back off the D and, uh, you know, quit being so foul-laden, and you're going to win more games. They're a top-five program right now within yeah. 18 months of making that decision. So the, the coaches that can self-evaluate can put aside what they've always done are the best and, and – uh, you know, we see it all through the profession, but we'll see if Chris Kleiman can do that. One more thought uh, from you before I let you go. The bowl situation. Chris Kleiman said even if they lose Saturday, they want to go to a bowl. Keith, I, 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 normally I say, hell yes, you got to go to bowl. you got to get the extra practices. you got to do that. And maybe that's, this goes into his i got to fix the team in the locker room thing. But I'm kind of the belief if you lose Saturday, just be done with this season, man. This, you just lost five in a row. And, you know, if if you've got problems in the locker room, you're not going to magically solve them in the, another month of lockdown. You know, the, the guys, the players have to be fatigued by not being able to be college students. You know, they, they, all they do is yeah. sit in their rooms and Zoom classes and go to practice. And they don't really have – and whenever they do go – have a little bit of fun. Someone gets infected and spreads it around the locker room and all hell breaks loose. Uh, nobody gets really sick. They just sit out. Um, you know, as we know with this pandemic, this this demographic that's playing college football isn't overly threatened by it. Um, right. I, if I'm a player, I'm like, Coach, we're four and six. Let's not, let's, can we just get this over with and go on to the next thing instead of this season? Because this season has been a pain in the ass. Your thoughts on a bowl game? Well, players like to play, coaches like to coach, so that's probably not realistic that they're going to turn down the opportunity to go play in a bowl game, although there's not as many bowl games. A lot of them are getting canceled, so, and they're not really selling tickets. You know, K-State thing was always, hey, we can sell a bunch of tickets, so there's nothing there. you got to get invited, first of all. I'm almost the opposite. If they win, um, if, if they won this game in the year of COVID, where your team was affected maybe with more people sitting out than anybody in the conference because you followed all the rules, 
Um, you beat Oklahoma. You pounded Kansas. You lost your fifth-year senior starting quarterback for the duration of the season, and you found a way to go 5-4 and four in the Big 12. Man, you might want to hang your hat on that and say, what a hell of a year this was. Yeah. Because, honestly, this game Saturday, if they win it, there's a lot to look back on and go, dang, that was pretty good. You know, pretty – and what might have been if they beat Oklahoma State in Baylor, you know, which they didn't, but they would have with Skylar Thompson. I mean, so close. If they won this game, I think you got to pat Clement on the back and say, man, you got the 5-4 and four without your quarterback in the year of COVID. You beat Oklahoma, a top-10 team, and you beat the living daylights out of Kansas. And if you're a K-State fan, recalibrate a little bit. That's a pretty good year. Yeah. Uh, you go 5-4 and four in the conference. Um in your second year at K State, I'll take it. Uh, you know the six and threes yep. need to come down the road. Um, seven and two, climb that ladder. But for this season, for what you've been through, uh, I can see your point. Yep. Well, it's Kevin good. Keatsman. He's my sidekick, as I like to say, yep. on this podcast. He enjoys not steering the ship all the time, and he joins us every week on the Fitz and Keats Powercat pregame show. And after this break, we will get to the roundtable. I've got them all awaiting on the other side as you listen to the Robbins Motor Company Powercat pregame show. The Powercat podcast will be right back. Picture this nightmare scenario. You're hosting friends for the big game. It's neck and neck in the fourth quarter, and suddenly you realize you're out of drinks. You start to sweat. Your friends start to turn on you. You're forced to go on a last-second drink run and end up missing the game-winning touchdown while in line. (whistles) Terrifying, isn't it? Luckily, you can avoid the drama with Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery. With Drizzly, you can shop a huge selection of beer, wine, and spirits, then get them delivered right to your watch party. Compare prices across multiple stores in your area, find the best deals on game day drinks, and get back to armchair quarterbacking from, you guessed it, your armchair. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com today. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. Life as a parent is nonstop. I'm so focused on keeping my family healthy that I barely have time to take care of myself. If this sounds like you, then you need to give Symbiotica a try. Symbiotica is a health and wellness company that empowers individuals to take ownership of their health with high-quality formulas and supplements crafted to boost energy, immunity, gut health, and more. Symbiotica supplements are made with clean, natural ingredients, and they don't contain any toxins or artificial ingredients. Because they were designed for us, busy parents. They're quick and easy to take. Just a daily dose for your energy, immune system, and overall well-being. It's made staying consistent so much easier easier. And the best part? Symbiotica is having their holiday sale, so now's the perfect time to put your health in the driver's seat. Head to Symbiotica.com for 20% off with code GIFT20. That's C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com with code GIFT20 for 20% off. Your health transformation journey starts now. Symbiotica Natural and Organic Supplements. We now send it back to the PowerCat Podcast. Welcome back to the PowerCat pregame show sponsored by Robbins Motor Company. The dedicated team of automotive professionals at Robbins, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Fiat will match you with a vehicle that suits your lifestyle and budget. Robbins Motor Company, title sponsor of the PowerCat pregame show. And now we are joined by Go Paracat's own Ryan Wallace. By the way, a spectacular recruiting Wednesday at Go Paracat. Thank you very much for you and your team and what they did. I really like having recruiting Wednesdays, Wally. They've worked out really well. And this was an especially um, important recruiting Wednesday, at least for um, me and the staff, because we got to unveil our it's the third year we've actually done it, the Go Paracat All-Stars, which... Um, we were able to get outfits real quick, not to get on a recruiting rant here, but, uh, the, the team that go power cat was actually able to hit up, uh, close to 30 games, um, this fall between myself, Zach Carlson, Ryan Gilbert and Adam Suderman. So, um, we were able to see a lot of different kids, a lot of committed kids to K state, some that, um, could be committed in the future. And, uh, I, I think that, that really gives us a leg up on the competition because we're able to see a lot of these players play under the lights on Friday nights. And we get a, a pretty good 
vantage point of, of, you know, who's good, maybe who's overhyped. And anyhow, we, we put out our all-star teams and I'm really proud of, of the job that the guys were able to do this fall. Yeah, it turned out to be really, really nice and great coverage for the subscribers over at Go Power Cap. Well, let's talk about K-State Texas a little bit. I don't know what to think of this game, and um, I, I'm just going into it to see how emotionally invested both teams are. But from a structural standpoint, from looking at the roster, uh, Texas should win this game. But I don't think this game really is about talent and skill as much as who really wants to be there on Saturday playing this game because I'm not sure it's the Longhorns because I think they're kind of done. But I'm not sure of the mental state of Kansas State coming off that heartbreaking loss of Baylor. What are your thoughts? Uh, I'm the same way. I mean, to me, the most entertaining aspect about this game isn't anything that's going to uh, occur on the field. I mean, for the most part, you'll be able to tell kind of which direction each team is going from the opening kickoff. I, I think it'll be that blatantly obvious which team wants to be there and which team doesn't. Um, I, I think that K-State has a little bit of an edge um, only because Chris Kleiman has proven time and time again, he did it against uh, Oklahoma coming off the loss at Arkansas State, that he does have an ability to, to get this team to rebound. Um, with Texas – there are so many things going on right now in the news that it's impossible for a college kid down there not to read the headlines about Urban Meyer or, you know, is Tom Herman gone? Now they have two of their captains that have opted out of the last two games of the season. And, you know, not just captains, but a captain on defense in Caden Stearns and a captain on offense at offensive tackle Sam Cosme. I mean, Fitz, these are two guys, we're talking 60 plus starts between the two of them when two of those guys just walk out on the rest of the season and there's already some question marks about whether your head coach is going to return next year. There's a lot bubbling from underneath the Texas locker room that, uh, you know, again, if you're a Kansas state fan, if there's anything you want to try and hang your hat on, you might be able to say, Hey, we're on a losing streak, but we might actually have more confidence than the team coming in. It's incredible. Wally, I want to get your thoughts. You're pretty astute about things like this. I understand not playing a bowl game that doesn't mean much. But walking out on your team with regular season games to play, even in this strange pandemic season, seems a little uh, just not right. It's just it's off. I, I don't I don't see how they can do that. And if I was a teammate, I'd be pretty pissed off about about it happening. Well, that's like I said, I mean, we're talking about two team captains. I mean, Caden Stearns is the leading tackler on this team this year. And to me, if, if you wanted to opt out before the season, like several K-State players did, there's, there's nothing I can say against that. And, and there's nothing really anybody can say against that because it was just um, a personal preference and a sign of the times. So who, who thought that we would we would even be talking about K State and Texas this deep into the season without any cancellations on K State's half? So from that perspective, there's nothing wrong with it um, if you had done it early. When you do it and there's still two games left in the season, and oh by the way, there's all this turmoil with your head coach, and oh shucks, now we're not going to play for a Big Twelve championship anymore. Now I decide I, I want to hit the exit. Uh, I think that is not only a reflection of these two players, and, and if I'm an NFL franchise, I might raise my eyes to that a little bit, but I think it's also maybe a reflection of just the state of the Texas locker room, and maybe Tom Herman doesn't have quite the, the grip on things and, and the, uh, the culture, a positive culture down there um, that he wants and the kind of culture that, that Chris Kleiman is trying to preach and build at K-State. I agree. Let's get your thoughts on the offense for Texas. Sam Ellinger's pretty special. He uh, He's a great leader. But what are your overall thoughts on a Texas offense that leans on him an awfully lot? Yeah, I mean, I think this will be one of the best offenses, um, skill player-wise, and just overall balance that K-State has seen um, in several weeks. I think, you know, had Oklahoma State had Chuba Hubbard, for more of that game, obviously they're a very potent offense, and I think Iowa State has some some playmakers. But again, just from an overall balance of how strong Texas is rushing the football, how strong they are passing the football, this is a very well oiled machine. Most offensive touchdowns in the league fits twenty five. That's you know more than OU, 
more than Iowa State, more than Oklahoma State, West Virginia. They're number two offense in the Big 12, and it all starts because of Sam Ellinger. And for the most part, um, he has really limited his turnovers, and he has been uh, the focal point of this offense, both from a passing standpoint and a rushing standpoint. Uh, they, they have playmakers all over the board and big playmakers at that. So it's, I mean, this will be uh, a couple of guys, whether it's in the running in the backfield or out at wide receiver with a guy like Brennan Eagles that are matchup issues for the majority of defenses that they go against. Yeah, they are. It, it is going to be difficult. I'll be intrigued to see how Kansas State handles it. Brennan Eagles is one of those guys that um, – I watch and I see him do spectacular things, and then I see him drop balls like, man, you got to make that catch. So hopefully it's the bad version of him because he is a matchup nightmare, big, strong, fast kid, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how K-State handles that. Defensively, Texas, of course, has talent. They haven't always performed up to that, but they were pretty good against Iowa State on Saturday, even in defeat. Your thoughts on this Longhorn defense? It's interesting, Fitz, because they're number eight overall defense in the Big 12, and their pass defense is dead last. They're averaging 286 uh, yards per game on, uh, allowed on them and almost uh, a 65% completion rate for the opponents. And I think a lot of that has to do, honestly, with just not being able to pressure the quarterback enough. They have Joseph Asai. Uh, he has been probably the MVP uh, now that Caden Stearns is out of the picture anyway, he's been the MVP, I think, for this defense. And, uh, again, they're, they're better against the rush. Um, but when, it, when it's a passing situation, uh, their front four, front seven has just struggled to generate any sort of pressure. And it's kind of hung some younger defensive backs out to dry at times. And I think, um, in a way, that has kind of made the stats look a little bit worse uh, for the pass defense than maybe they are. But... I scratch my head with this Texas defense fits because you go down the depth chart and they're all recognizable names. And I'm not even just saying from a recruiting standpoint, I'm saying, wow, this, this kid's a junior already. Like I can't believe he's been playing this long and yet they're still not producing. So I can't put my finger on what the problem is individually, but I, I just know collectively it doesn't seem like they're generating enough pressure. Yeah. Well, one thing in Texas's favor, I think K State will help out its pass defense stats because that's not something K State's going to do a ton of. If K State goes for two ninety five through the year, I'm going to say K State wins. Let's just put it that way, uh, and we'll we'll think of it as a, a good three week span for the K State offense because they've been doing about a hundred a game. If you're lucky, it's just been really hard to fathom how K State has stuck in games. And really it comes down to this is K State offense is gonna have to move the ball against this defense. And I thought last at least last week, Wally, they showed some signs of life. They got the ball out to Briley Moore for a big play. Um the running game had its highest production of the year. Will Howard did some damage. Deuce Vaughn was back in, in the kind of playing style we've grown accustomed to already. But the offense has to take care of the ball, possess the ball. And I tell you what, when it comes to if they got the lead in the fourth quarter, maybe pick up a first down or two because that was a big difference in that Baylor game. Well, I think you just hit the nail on the head when you talked about possessing the football. I think that that's one of the key elements to this game. You know, penalties and, and turnovers are obviously big, but they're big every week. You know, and, and obviously with Texas, they're the most penalized team in the Big 12, almost 78 yards per game. So that is an area that K-State should win. Uh, the turnover battle, for the most part, K-State has been efficient at this year. But time of possession, both of these teams are killing themselves, in particular their defenses, with time of possession. Texas um, is one of the worst teams in the Big 12 uh, with time of possession. They leave their defense out on the field. You think K-State leaves its defense out on the field a lot. Texas has left its defense out on the field a whole heck of a lot. So when K-State needs to move the chains, um, when they need long drives, they're going to have to deliver on Saturday to beat Texas. And the same goes for the Longhorns. I think this might come down to, as you pointed out with K-State's offense, not so much passing against uh, this 
this tech maligned uh, Texas pass defense, but who can run the ball and who can stay on the field? Because as we saw in Waco, Baylor possessed the ball more than K state. They, you know, elongated drives. K state cannot let Sam Ellinger and company do that to them, particularly in the run game, or it's going to be just another bad note for the regular season um, for the Wildcats to end on. Does K state get this done against Texas? Uh, I, I mean, to me, as we sit here today, it's literally a coin flip for me. Um, I think that K-State, as I mentioned, from a locker room standpoint, I think they have more things going in their favor. But I also think that it, this is a Texas team that's kind of hungry to, you know, not go out uh, on a bad note. I, I do think that they still see two winnable games on the, on the schedule with K-State and KU. Um, so, again, I'm 50-50. But my gut does lean a little bit with the Longhorns only because of that rushing attack, whether it's Ellinger, whether it's Ingram, Robinson, Johnson. They've got all sorts of guys that they can throw at K-State. And until I see K-State's offense get it done when it matters in the third and fourth quarters, i, I got to lean with Texas right now. But it's, it's a toss-up. Thank you, Ryan Wallace. And now we bring in Brian Hanley, our football analyst at GoPowerCat.com. And, of course, as you know, Offensive lineman on those 97 and 98 teams. I talked to Brandon Clark on one of my podcasts today or this week. Brian, the receiver, he was a young yes. cop when you were around. He was. And now he's built a dynasty at Derby High School. He has. He has. Man, it is uh, really impressive uh, how he's kind of taken this and that, some Bill Snyder, some from his high school coach, and and really found his way in coaching. It's it's a pretty cool story, and that's on the Sources podcast this week over at Go Powercat. It was fun. Good deal. Let's get into the Texas Longhorns and the Kansas State Wildcats, and uh, I would love to get some in-depth breakdowns here, but, Brian, am I being too simplistic to say – Whoever wants it is probably going to get it because neither team really is coming in with much head of steam. Texas now being eliminated from the Big 12 championship game. They've kind of lost their motivation. They've lost some players. They might be losing their coach in Kansas State, of course, has lost four straight and really a heartbreaker on Saturday. Is it too simple to say who wants it can have it? No, it's not. It's actually that's about a good assessment as as you can have at this point in the season with everything that's going on. Uh, that, that's a great assessment, actually. It's just who wants this football game? Uh, do do we want to turn it around? Do we want to 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 change the narrative going into the off season and change what you know? What looked like a promising season has taken a turn for the worse. Do we want to to stop that? Um, does Texas want to, you know, even though it's they expected more? It's, I mean, it's a disappointing season for them because they I know they expected more. They should have more. And now that they're literally, I mean, they're just playing for pride. Do they have that pride to play? You know, do they have enough pride to play? Who knows? Um, it's going to be really interesting. And you'll know early. I mean, you'll know early who wants to to win the football game. Usually, linemen. I know that's uh, I'm a little biased when it comes to that, but offensive linemen, you'll you'll be able to tell is their running room are they protecting? You know, you'll you'll know early on this one on who does what and who wants what. We'll be able to see it. Well, if a bunch of Longhorns give up the fight, I know one Longhorn that won't, and that is Sam Ellinger, and that kid comes to play every week. He plays it on the line. All he's wanted in life is to be the quarterback at the University of Texas, and this may be his last game. I imagine they'll play a bowl game. I'm not sure. I'm not so certain they'll play the uh, Texas KU game next week. I don't know if there's much point in playing that. Um, I know Kansas probably doesn't want to play a game they don't have to play. Uh, But I I really like Sam Ellinger. He just plays so hard. He gets after it. He's not perfect. He makes mistakes. But uh, if if you want a guy that's going to lead you into battle, I'd follow him. I, I really am impressed by him. Yeah, he is the quintessential. I grew up in the state. I want to be the quarterback of the, of the state university. I know A and M is there, but Texas is the state university. It just is what it is. Yeah, I want to be the quarterback there. I am the quarterback. I'm going to give 
everything that I have on every play, which again, as you mentioned, sometimes gets him into trouble because he doesn't know when to give up on a play sometimes, but just that's who you want as your leader. That's who you want. You want a guy that wants, that's going to give everything that he's had because and just like you said, his whole life. I mean, you know, he's wanted to be the quarterback in Texas and, and he is now, and he plays like it. He plays like this is his dream and he doesn't want his dream to end. He plays like that on every snap. That uh, there, you can't do anything but respect that. Uh, and it's something we're going to have to 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 look out for and look out for. I mean, it's something we're going to have to take into account because the guy plays hard and he's not a bad football player to boot. No, not at all. I he really gets after it, you know. But this Texas team, they've had a couple opt outs, and in, including Kate well, Stearns, their their defensive back that they just loved, second leading tackler on the season for the Longhorns, and it just is so Texas, Brian. Well, if we can't yeah. play for the Big Twelve Championship, what do we have to play for? I'm going to quit playing. Yep. Uh, yep. And I, I don't know how that attitude doesn't. Uh, spread throughout the locker room. I just don't see how they're going to come in here unless they really love Tom Herman and want to fight for him. But do you get that impression? I don't. I do not at all. I, I, I don't get that impression one bit. I think the guys want to, they, I mean, Texas is Texas. And it's just what you said. It, it's so Texas for, hey, if we can't play for it, I'm done. Um, I've got NFL prospects. I'm going to go do that. And God bless them if that's what guys want to do. I don't blame anybody for doing anything. I would have a hard time doing that because, and I say it all the time, I believe that it's walking out on your team. I understand that you have you know money to go play for and you have a career and all that. And if that's the case, then just don't play at all. But don't suit up and then decide, well, you know what? Hey, maybe I'm a little banged up and I have an opportunity to get drafted you know, decent. I'm going to go do that. And then you should have done that from the begin with, but if you're going to play, then play, don't let me down and have us depend on you. And then you just say, well, this is more important to me. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be more important, but then just don't be a part of what we're doing because we're part of a team. And I don't believe Texas is in it for, I don't believe they're in it for their coach. I believe they were in it to win. I mean, they're kids. They were, they were trying to win, but now that they're not, there, I don't. I, I haven't seen anything that says, "Hey, let's win one for the coach." Absolutely not. And I haven't seen anything that says, "Hey, let's win one for Texas." <laughs> it's just kind of a team of we're all individuals, and if it comes together, great. But if it doesn't, well, too bad, so sad. It amazes me that that attitude is so pervasive at Texas. Uh, but you don't see it at other schools like LSU or Alabama. Maybe you see it at Michigan. I don't know. I'm not familiar with those schools enough. But you've got a locker room full of guys that could play at the league in the league. But you, it doesn't seem like any coach as of late has been able to put them together into a team, not a collection nope. of individuals, a team. And I don't know if it's Urban Meyer that solves that. I would guess he would get it farther down the road if they can hire him. But if it's not Urban Meyer – I don't know who else can get that done because, uh, you know, Charlie Strong didn't. Tom Herman's not getting it done. Uh, I, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure how they'll get it done. But what is it about Texas? Is it just because these kids, so many of them, have grown up as the stud football player in Texas high school football, which is such a big deal, and then they go to the University of Texas, and they're going to be a star. And it's just like they're above all the work. They're above all the bonding. They're all above all the stuff that you really need to do to make a good football team. I don't get it, I guess is what I'm saying. Brian, I don't get it at all. I, I mean, that's part of it. It starts with the coach, though. I, I mean, I, I won't begrudge any of that. Look, like I mentioned in the post game when we were talking a little bit about Texas last week, is I'm, I'm a Louisville fan. And I grew, I grew up there. Charlie Strong had it made at Louisville, went to Texas. I knew it wasn't going to work because he didn't want to do what you have to do as a Texas high school or as a Texas coach, which is bond with the high school coaches because 
you have to do that at the University of Texas because technically those guys want to coach at the University of Texas. So if you want them to send players, you got to bond with them. And Charlie Strong didn't do that. Tom Herman could do that. I don't, don't believe Tom Herman's that good of a football coach. That's my opinion. I just don't think that he's that good of a football coach. When you mentioned the other schools like Alabama and the LSUs and the Ohio States, um, the difference there. Tim is the coaches that pro, those programs look you're going to compete from day one and yes we have a lot of guys that can go and play in the NFL how you're going to get to the NFL is you're going to compete here and you're going to compete right now and if you don't compete you will not play and it doesn't matter if you are a third year a five-star player and this is your junior year and you waited in line if we've got a freshman that comes in that's better than you they are going to play i don't believe the competition at texas i don't believe they they fester that type of competition there i don't believe they believe in that there i I just i just don't because you can see it on the field you see when you see a a lsu or an alabama or georgia ohio state those guys are competing on every snap and even when games get out of hand and they put in the backups those guys are competing for every snap you don't see that at texas you just don't and that's coaching And I mean, it doesn't come down to anything but coaching because they have the talent and nobody will ever be able to tell me that Texas doesn't have the talent. Just look at an NFL draft. Those guys have talent. They have it. They just, they, they can't put it together. And that's, that's, that's literally coaching and too bad for them. That's better for us because we can compete when, when, with them, when they can't put it together, we can compete with them. Even we don't have as talented as a team. Now, when our talent is equal, then we just whip them. And and that's, I mean, it's just the way that it is. You know, when, when talent was equal, we owned Texas. We just did, yep. you know, and when even when the talent wasn't as equal, but we played together, then that's what happens. And it's just until they can figure that out and get a guy in there that's going to say, forget all these this tradition stuff. You're going to come in here and fight like crazy just to get on the field until they get that, then it's going to be what it is what it is. Absolutely. Very well said. And as far as Kansas State goes, Brian, they ran for a season-high yards last week at Baylor. Yeah. They ran the ball effectively. I, stats are padded a little bit by that jet sweep by Malik Knowles, but Deuce Vaughn goes over 100 yards. Uh, Harry Trotter had success every time he touched the ball, and I'm not sure why he didn't touch it twice as many times as he did, but he didn't. Right. Will Howard's still a threat, and they yep. did it with backup guards. I was just really impressed with what the offensive line and running game did at Baylor, but it was Baylor, too. And I'll, I'll be right. intrigued to see if the Texas defensive line is engaged and they can put up a fight because it, it, physically it could be a mismatch for a young offensive line. It could be. It very well could be. At the same time, Texas gives up yards, too. I mean, they, they don't just say hey, you line up and they just don't. You can't run it against us. That's not what Texas is. I don't know a ton about them, just like you. I don't know. But uh, the, enough, the stuff that I've seen, they're not just lining up and saying, you're not running it. You're not moving it. If you try to to, to throw, we're just going to get in your – just live in your backfield. They're not that. Now, again, young offensive line, um, who knows what can happen? You know, um, not playing great, although they played great last week. I mean, I'll I'll give the offensive line credit. They played great last week. That was a good performance out of them. Um, But who knows? Texas isn't just a team that can line up and stop us. So if we have the right play calls and schemes uh, and do the things that we can do well and continue to do it and keep them off balance, we'll be able to move the football against them. Thank you, Brian Hanley. We go from Big B to Little K. Kelly Stewart, Kelly in Vegas, our gambling expert, K-State alumnus, and all-around great lady. You're a nice lady. Kelly, how are you? <laughs> it's been a while since I've heard that one. Nice lady. Oh, man, I wouldn't touch this game with anyone's money. I wouldn't bet Ron Prince's money with this game uh, because I don't know – how either one of these teams is going to respond to the situation in which they're in. Your thoughts on Texas K-State? 
Yeah, look, Tim, how do teams, how do good teams and well-coached teams respond? They respond well. I mean, look, K-State's off four straight losses. Two were bloodbaths, two were close losses. That Baylor game, look, K-State got the cover. They couldn't get the win. It was really frustrating um, from a fan perspective, but I didn't complain from a Vegas perspective, right? They did everything I needed them to do, and that was cover that game. This is a Texas team that we're hearing tons of drama. Now, I know you and I always hear about the K-State drama, but I get a lot of info about Texas drama as well. And, you know, they're just never satisfied. And if you want to push out a, a really great coach like Tom Herman, uh, Texas is a place to do it. So for me, it's like this. The line opened at Circa on Sunday at 10. I bet 10. I bet 9. Now the line opens in the rest of the world, and it's 7. And I'm going, oof. I don't know if I can bet it at seven. No. If it hits six and a half, I may be looking towards the Longhorns. The, the problem is, is this. When you have a team like Texas, whose expectation levels are high year in and year out, it, it's really hard for them to pick up with the pieces. And when you have a K-State team whose expectations are mediocre year in and year out, you pull off upset wins like they did in Oklahoma. And then you fall flat on your face like they do in Ames. And so it's, it's really an interesting spot. This is K-State's last home game. If they want to make a bowl game that doesn't get canceled, then this is their last chance to do it. I, I like the Wildcats here. I think that Texas is not one of those teams that usually responds well from adversity. Yeah. I, uh, so much of the adversity is, Self-imposed. I mean, they've just kind of put pressure on themselves. When, when you set your bar at <clears throat> Big 12 title game or bust, you've busted. I mean, you're, you're virtually out of it. And uh, I I don't know if Texas will even show up. Sam, Sam Ellinger will show up. He'll be good. He, he'll yeah, fight. absolutely. Uh, but I'm not sure the rest of the team is prepared to fight for their coach and try to save his neck if it can be saved at this point. We'll find out. Uh, I, I take it from what you think, Texas will probably win, but the the difference here is whether they get the cover at 7 or 10 or whatever someone was fortunate enough to bet. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see K-State win this game, though. That's the, interesting, that's the interesting part, and we know that they have the ability to do it. They have the talent. It's The problem is, is for them to put it together for four quarters, right? Yeah. They tried to put it together for four quarters against Oklahoma State. They tried to do it against Baylor. Uh, didn't look like they tried against Iowa State or West Virginia. So which K-State team is going to show up? It's hard for me to tell people when I tell everybody bet numbers, not teams. It's hard for me to tell them it's okay. I bet 10 and 9. It's okay for you to bet 7. So I, I think this is a total stay away spot. Very good. Uh, Kansas goes to Texas Tech. That game I think was 31. Uh, I, I'm just astonished by the number. That Tech was getting as a 31-point favorite. It looks like it's down to about 27-and-a-half right now. Still a pretty big number. Tech beating someone by four touchdowns, even if it's Kansas, is hard for me to absorb. But then again, Kansas is done. They're just done. They're playing out the string right now. They're done with everything. I, I'll be surprised they play Texas next week. I'll be surprised if they really show up and are invested in this game. I guess I would take Texas Tech, even with the large number here. Yeah, I can't advise doing that. We talked about this KU team last week, and, and it's really, really difficult to back them. But it's also really difficult to lay a ton of points with a bad defense that is essentially Texas Tech. We've seen them show some promise at times this year and other times just give up a ton of points. So here's a, a Texas Tech team I said last week would, would fight hard against Oklahoma State, and they did. They, they showed some promise and they got the cover. Then, you know, a couple weeks before that, uh, with the bye, they were able to beat this Baylor team. They, you know, kept it close. Well, not really. They kind of kept it close with TCU, but this is an up and down type of team as well. Now we're asking them to fulfill a role that they're not really capable of fulfilling, and that's beating a team by four touchdowns. Again, this is a stay away game for me, but I wouldn't be surprised to see KU sneak through the back door. Very interesting. Oklahoma State, about a field goal favorite at TCU. Is Oklahoma State going to respond to the win over Texas Tech with a road win at TCU? In theory, yes. Uh, this game looks like it's begging for me to bet Oklahoma State. Begging. 
they just gotta let, they just gotta win on the road, right? And this is kind of what we talked about with Iowa State last week, and then we saw that line creep towards Iowa State's direction. They were able to get the win, but it was a really close game. I think this is very indicative of what the line says. This is going to be a very close game. Okay. Baylor goes to Oklahoma coming off their second win of the season, but they are a 22-point dog. Uh, Oklahoma's playing extremely well right now. How do you feel about this one? Oklahoma has been playing extremely well, and, and we spoke about this last week when I told you I liked West Virginia. We didn't get to see that game. we got to wait another week to see it. Uh, here's a Baylor team off a really emotional win. Congrats to them. Now we have to look at it from a different perspective and say, okay, how do they respond? How do they take that win over Kansas State and capitalize on it? Uh, 22 points. Look, this – Line is going to be inflated in terms of Baylor. Do I want to take, or excuse me, in terms, terms of Oklahoma, do I want to take Baylor? Not necessarily. The over looks really, really easy. Uh, really easy. So I, I lean towards the under there. Okay. My favorite game of the week. West Virginia goes to Ames, Iowa to take on Iowa State. The clones are up to ninth in the nation. They're a virtual lock, even with a loss probably, to get into the Big 12 championship game. I think so. This is a big one, though. Iowa State coming off. uh, They kind of pounded on what you might call their rival now in Kansas State. Then they go to Texas and win. They're flying high, but West Virginia can be a little bit scary. Iowa State opens as a seven-point favorite. Iowa State is flying way too high, and that is why I like West Virginia here. Look, they just clinched their first uh, chance to go to a Big 12 title game in forever. If they were to win, it would literally be forever, since before my grandmother was born was the last time they won a title game. Now, all jokes aside, this is a a, a really – Good West Virginia team. I liked them last week, if you remembered, and then the game got canceled. Was really frustrated with that one because I really thought that was a spot for West Virginia. But now I think this is even more of a spot for West Virginia because they basically got a bye week. Um, And if they were coming off of an Oklahoma loss or a close loss, I would say, hey, look, this Iowa State team's got all the momentum. Well, now Iowa State. And including their coach, Matt Campbell, very emotional after that win at Texas. This is, they're right for the upset. I like West Virginia here, and I actually gave this out on uh, our Wager Talk show this morning as my best college bet for this week. Forget this pandemic. The last time Iowa State played for a conference title was the last major pandemic. The Spanish flu hadn't even happened. Yep. (laughs) That's how long it's been. It's incredible. Congratulations to Matt Campbell on getting the Cyclones to the Big 12 title game and probably on a new job at Michigan. I hope not, Uh, but I I can totally see that. I mean, when you get those big-name jobs, they come with uh, big-name paychecks. Yeah, I hope he stays. I hope he's good for the conference. I'd like him to pull a Bill Snyder. They will pay him as much as possible. He's happy there. He's got something going. But, boy, he's a kind of a Big Ten guy from that region. It's going to be hard to turn down if Michigan comes calling because that is one of the storybook jobs. You know, that's the one, if you're growing up in the shadow of Michigan, to be able to coach there would be pretty big. Uh, We'll see what happens with that. I agree. Thank you, Kelly Stewart. Much appreciated, as always. Kansas State, Texas. It all goes down 11 a.m. at Bill Snyder Family Stadium on Saturday. The Cats are hoping to end that four-game losing streak and end this regular season on a high note. The Longhorns, well, they are eliminated from the Big 12 championship, and what will they have in the tank as they come to Manhattan? We're going to find out, and then after the game, Brian Hanley and I will discuss it all on the Powercat Post Game Podcast. Make sure you join us for that. Make sure you tune in on Fox to see the game, and we appreciate Robbins Motor Company for their ongoing sponsorship of the Powercat Pregame Show. Powercat Podcast. All rights reserved. GoPowercat.com and Spirit Street Publishing.
Now streaming on Paramount Plus. The choice is lightning in a bottle. When you are associated with something legendary, you're like, what am I supposed to do now? Witness the inspiring true story of Black Sheep's Dreads. I wound up with the opportunity to make an album from Dilla's catalog. One of the illest producers ever. The choice is yours. Exposes the journey of one legend carrying two legacies. Even if we fall flat on our face, at least we was trying to be ourselves. Catch the new documentary, The Choice is Yours. Now streaming exclusively on Paramount Plus.